Welcome to the Media Roundtable. We're talking to leading podcasters and, in our case today, uh, network creators about shows they create, why they create them, and the impact that they have on the world. So whether you're a listener or a member of the advertising community, you can better understand the content that is out there and feel good about what you consume and what you support. I'm your host, Dan Granger, and today we're joined by a very interesting gentleman named David Mays. Dave Mays is uh, the co-founder of a new venture called Breakbeat, which is a hip-hop podcast network. Dave is the entrepreneur who, uh, as a 19-year-old Harvard sophomore, launched uh, The Source magazine uh, as a single-page newsletter, and it grew to become the number one selling music magazine on newsstands globally, outselling Rolling Stone with a total audience of 9 million readers each month, not too shabby. Uh, we're going to talk to him about his vision for Breakbeat uh, and uh, and how it's going to serve the hip-hop community and hopefully the advertising community. So welcome, Dave. Glad to have you here and glad to finally meet you in person. Yes, yes. Really happy to be talking. here. Great to meet you. And uh, yeah, we've been having some great conversations. I appreciate all the you know insights and guidance you've been uh, providing you know to me and to Kendrick. So uh, it's good. yeah, it's great to be here. Yeah. So um, we are uh, we are here for for a little while. Uh, and the primary focus is I want to understand what is Breakbeat? What are we trying to do here? Sure, sure. Well, I mean, it, it's it's a few things. I think first and foremost, um, it is a, a, a network, a content network that is targeting the global hip-hop community mm -hmm. um, across the multiple generations that hip-hop spans as a music and culture and influence uh, now from Gen X all the way through millennials and, and now, of course, with Gen Z. Um, you know, hip hop, while the music is the, you know, most visible, the most popular kind of commercial aspect of hip hop that, you know, is most everybody associates hip hop with the music and the artists, um, you know, hip hop is really much more complex as uh, more of a culture, more of a, uh, something that influences uh, a community that share certain ways of thinking, ways of looking at the world that they, you know, tend to have in common when you're, when you're part of the hip-hop community. Um, hip-hop is something that, you know, I recognized, you know, 30-some years ago uh, to be potentially the most, you know, powerful force in the world and in that uh, it's a music and culture that crosses over all, you know, traditional boundaries and dividing lines, whether it's race, whether it's class, whether it's, you know, geographical location. Uh, hip hop has appeal to, you know, people that, you know, just brings people together, has the ability to kind of unify people in a way, unlike really, you know, anything else out there. And that's been my driving force really for 30 years, what I was building with the source and now, um, you know, kind of coming back with Breakbeat. Um, you know, podcasting is just such a, you know, dynamic, uh, interesting, uh, active, growing medium. Um, I think it has a, you know, a long future still, although, of course, it's been around for a while. Um, but uh, I think it's really coming, you know, into its prime. And so it, it provides a medium that really lends itself to, it lends itself to kind of creating the kind of a network that I've envisioned for the hip-hop community really, you know, in 15 years since I left the source, I've been thinking about this. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, we have a lot of different types of shows. We're doing, uh, you know, host-driven shows with a wide range of subject matters, um, you know, comprehensive. So, you know, you'll hear our hosts talking about um, music, of course, but we'll be talking politics, social justice, we'll be talking uh, sports, we'll be talking uh, health, business. Um, you're saying on some of the um, hosted shows, you're going to be covering uh, uh, social issues and politics, things like that um, within the show, or are there some shows dedicated to that, others dedicated to music? Um, right now we have eight shows that are in production and we're busy, you know, lining up a kind of a next slate of shows. So, yeah. um, these ones, I mean, the one show uh, that's out now is called Culturati, mm -hmm. um, conversations with Kierna Mayo. Uh, Kierna is one of the most, uh, well-respected, uh, journalists and media executives, uh, female, uh, in the hip hop community. She's done, 
you know, she was an editor at The Source in the early 1990s. She launched uh, a, a very successful, influential magazine called Honey Magazine. Um, she's been uh, an editor-in-chief at Ebony and worked with for Condé Nast and a bunch of other places. Um, so she's hosting the show. And this is, you know, more of a, you know, social, cultural issues, really interesting conversations. The current episode that's out now features her in conversation with W. Kamau Bell, um, you know, who's uh, got the show on CNN, if you're familiar with mm-hmm. him. Really interesting guy, and they have incredible conversations about race and the media and things like that. Um, so that show we just debuted. And then, you know, others, um, you know, that's the most, the, probably the closest to the social political side. But we're also doing, you know, narrative, scripted, more produced uh, things. You know, the journalistic side of podcasting is something also that's attractive to me. Um, and, you know, in some ways, I think about a podcast network as the digital magazine of today yeah. and something that, you know, magazine companies have struggled with for years, you know, trying to figure out what is a digital magazine. Right. Um, so I felt like that was, you know, a, an opportunity with, with podcasts. And we have a couple of uh, docuseries that we're doing. Oh, wow. Um, one is the story of the unsigned hype column in the Source magazine as an eight-part series. We're partnered with Spoke Media, who's a really you know, uh, interesting, successful podcast producer out of New York. Um, and we're uh, telling the story. That's a column in the Source magazine in the 90s that is arguably the most influential magazine column in history. Uh, we would review demo tapes from unsigned rappers that were Hmm. turned into us every month. Through that column, we discovered Biggie, Eminem, DMX, Mob Deep, (laughs) Capone and Noriega, (laughs) um, David Banner, Jay Electronica, uh, Common, you know, got these guys their record deals. Yes, you know. Wow. So that column, we're telling the whole backstory of it, all the people that worked at the source oh, with me awesome. and the, you know, the artists and everybody involved. And then the other one that I'm excited about, I think it will be even bigger and, and actually you know, also delves very much into social justice and social, political, cultural issues is the Larry Hoover story. Um, a lot of people may not know who Larry Hoover is. He's uh, extremely well known in the hip hop and kind of urban culture over the years. He's a kind of mythologized figure. Um, he's known uh, mainly in mainstream media as the founder of the Gangster Disciples uh, from Chicago in the 1960s that uh, rose to become one of the largest kind of street gang organizations uh, in the country in the 70s. Um, he's currently in the Supermax prison with El Chapo and the Unabomber. They've had him there for 25 years. Um, And the true story of Larry Hoover is that he went through a transformation while in prison um, in the late 80s and early 90s, and he he refashioned Gangster Disciples as growth and development and had a whole uh, community, you know, plan in place, and he specifically got into politics Hmm. and he was registering thousands of voters in the Chicago and Illinois area. He started an organization called 21st Century Vote that was a real political player in Chicago and Illinois and you know one of the people had meetings with Bill Clinton at the White House and um, it was in those years that uh, they kind of put a federal investigation on him and found a way to put him away permanently and a lot of people believe He's a political prisoner. So it has a really interesting story that ties in with the gun violence problems uh, that we all read about and hear about in Chicago. Uh, You understand more the history uh, 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 that's gone on in that city that has created the conditions um, and how Larry Hoover's story relates to that. A lot of people believe that if he were to be released, he could do a lot to help the the violence uh, in Chicago He's also known because Kanye West went yeah, to... Yeah, he just to, talked about him on this. Did he have his kid on his or something? His son is on yeah. his album, and he went to Donald Trump's office. We all probably remember when Kanye yeah. went to visit Donald Trump. But during that meeting with Trump, he specifically asked for Larry Hoover to be granted release by Trump. It didn't happen, but uh, it was on the agenda. Mm. So anyway, a super interesting, you know, very in-depth story that we're telling in 10 parts. So 
uh, that's I've been working on that for several months out in Chicago. Wow. And now you have a show or you are going to have a show very soon, correct? Can uh, we talk about that one? <laughs> yes, yes. I, I always tend to bring that up, you know, last, um, you know, which I have, I, to, gotcha. I have to get over <laughs> because, you know, I was always really a behind the scenes type of person uh, while I was building what I was doing at the source. And, you know, I wasn't the type of guy that, you know, wanted to put myself out there and get all the credit and the attention um, and, you know, I'll, I've decided in this day and age, you know, that I have to do things differently. So uh, one of those things you is... you got to steward the brand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you got to do that. You know, I can do that most effectively, I think, you know, being more of a public face and a public voice. Yeah. Uh, so I am excited to launch my podcast sometime in the next few weeks as well, the Dave Mays Show. Uh, I'll be recording that out of Chicago, uh, where I'm living right now. And, uh, yeah, excited about you know, the whole, the whole network and, um, you know, more to come. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So let, can we go into your background a little bit and talk sure. the source and everything else? So, so you're 19, you're at Harvard. This is what year? Uh, 1988. 88. And, and what prompted you? Like what, what got you, where, how did you get the bug and then how did it turn into a, a commercially viable business for you? Okay. Well, um, I guess a couple of things. Um, I grew up in Washington, D.C., um, you know, and from a young age, I just, you know, got kind of exposed to the music and the culture of the city and kind of fell in love with it. Um, and, uh, you know, when I got to Harvard, um, I, I had been doing some, uh, sales my last year of, of high school or, and, you know, kind of the summer after I did some phone sales and I'd always Where been. Where were you selling? By I, I was actually selling Time Life books. Ah. Uh, I would call and like cold call people across the country and sell them, you know, a series of books on the Civil War or different things like that. And I was I was killing it. I was like one of the top salespeople in the room, this big call room. You're like, how about um, I do this times a million? <laughs> <laughs> so that that was one of the things. I mean, I'd always been an entrepreneur at a young age, growing up in D.C. as well. I had different businesses. Oh, you grew up in D.C. Grew up in okay. D.C. Yes. Um, so when I got to Harvard, I um, joined a radio station because I met the, the one kid on Harvard's campus that I could find something in common with uh, who liked rap music. He was from Philadelphia um, named John Schechter. And, um, you know, he had interned at a radio station in Philadelphia, so he wanted to join the Harvard station. And we were able to go down there and get an hour radio show uh, to play hip hop late night on the weekends. It was a station that played classical music, but it had a very big signal. And back then there was very little hip hop on the radio. So people, you know, tuned in and found it on college stations. And we built a really big uh, listenership throughout the Boston area, not Harvard students, but people around the Boston area. Um, and I went out selling ads for my radio show. And the local businesses are, like, laughing at me, like, hey, buddy, you know, like, who's listening to a rap yeah. show on Harvard's radio station? Yeah, like, they yeah, play yeah. classical music. And, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I get calls from all over the city every week. I have so many, you know, hundreds and hundreds of loyal listeners. And, you know, I got to convince these guys. So I start building a mailing list of my listeners. And I'm writing down oh. everyone's name and address. Call in, join the mailing list. And started I'm, the database. You know, started the database. I have a 1,000 names and addresses by the summer of 1988, and then the idea, oh, let me create a newsletter. I sell ads on the back, and really that came from answering all those phone calls to write down names and addresses. I'm talking to hip-hop fans, and they all have questions. You know, when is the new Big Daddy Kane album coming out? And so you, you know, had your market who, research all pre-built in. The, you know, I'm like, man, people are thirsting for information, but there's nowhere in this day and age, even though hip hop was already big, Run DMC sold, yeah. you know, 5 million records in, in those years. And, um, there was no information anywhere for hip hop music fans. Um, and that's where the idea started. So it went from one page, it combined this entrepreneurial, you know, desire that I'd always had with this music and culture I had fallen in love with at a young age. And, you know, that was it. I, I read a book on Rolling Stone magazine shortly thereafter. Somebody gave me this book. I didn't know about Jan Winter or Rolling Stone at the time, but I read the book and, you know, saw all these parallels between rock and roll and hip hop and in the way Jan Winter created this sort of underground newspaper for rock fans and grew it into the voice of, you know, his generation. And uh, I saw 
you know, that hip hop could be even bigger than rock and roll because of its, you know, more multicultural appeal that I was talking about earlier. And that really became my initial model. I'm going to build the rolling stone of the hip hop generation, mm. but, you know, it's going to be bigger. And yeah. eventually that came true. Well, and as, um, I guess, c culturally and economically, uh, is, is rock and roll is probably the only proxy for what we've seen. Is that right? I mean, is there a anything that has taken the world by storm musically otherwise or really been part of a revolution in the same way? Well, I think, you know, you, you we've seen it with different, you know, genres to an extent. I mean, uh, I mean, rock, you know, that you mentioned, you know, rock started as music that African Americans created. Most people don't even know that to this day. It was, you know, Little Richard and Chuck Berry and folks like that that, that created it. And it, 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 you know, followed a different path because, you know, Elvis got, got into the rock thing early and kind of from there on out, it became much more of a music associated with white artists and white fans. And, um, but there were, you know, there were aspects of uh, soul and R&B in the 60s. You know, Marvin Gaye, you know, made socially conscious music. Blues music, you know, always had a, you know, a socially conscious, you know, element to it and uh, jazz as well. Sure. Um, so, you know, they all followed a little different trajectories. Um, but hip hop certainly has had tremendous staying power and doesn't seem to be slowing down. Um, you know, 40, really now going on 50 years since it was created, 1973. So we're in, you know, 48 years now. All right. So this is kind of a stupid question, but everybody struggles with it that makes a show. You're, you're, you're doing a, a podcast network about music. There's some terribly restrictive rules in place about what you can actually play on your podcast how do you deal with that when you're talking about music have, can you have you figured out how to license it or how to get to play samples of what of the music you're talking about yeah well, well first thing that i want to kind of point out is that you know we don't think of breakbeat as a music network it's a network uh, like i described before that's covering you know a comprehensive range of subject matter from the perspective of the hip hop community. Mm -hmm. um, so music is certainly a, an element and something that will be part of different shows. And um, but w none of our shows right now are reliant upon playing, you know, uh, copywritten music uh, on the shows. Um, you know, the documentary style ones. You know, those will. You know, there's fair use uh, rights that you can use certain amounts of music. Um, that we're uh, looking at with something like unsigned hype. Um, but, uh, you know, it's an interesting area that I think, you know, podcasting would do well in some ways to, to solve, um, similar to what we've seen with uh, social media platforms in the last few years. I mean, you know, it took TikTok, you know, to really integrate music into social media that yeah. kind of forced Instagram's hand, you know, to finally cough up and start paying for music licenses and allowing, you know, users to incorporate music into some of your posts now. Um, so, you know, I'm sure there's a business model that can and should and will emerge to, you know, make it easier in the podcasting industry to incorporate music into podcasts. We're hoping so. Yeah. We're hoping so. So, um, you're you're running the source all through the 90s okay and um sometimes we see uh art imitate life and sometimes uh life imitates art right how how much did you see happening in the world around you during that time that was influenced uh by the industry um how close was I to things that were going on in the industry? Well, let, okay, let, let me give you the obvious example. The East Coast-West Coast rivalry that was yeah. going on at that time. You were in the center of that somewhat, were you not? Sure, yes. I mean, the, the, you also, it was you produced the Source Awards. I did. Right? I created the Source Awards, produced them all. Right. So uh, can you share what that uh, period of time was like when there were real tensions heating up and—, and you know, to the extent that, that you were, you know, involved or not? How yeah. did you deal with that going on? Yeah, I mean, I, I one of the ways that I built the source from, you know, very early on was, you know, building good relationships with the talent, with the record labels, with the management. You know, I would kind of have, 
you know, relationships at all the different levels throughout the music industry. Um, and in that sense, I was in the middle, like you said, of everything. The source, you know, was kind of like the United Nations of hip hop in those years. Yeah. And everybody, you know, kind of dealt with us and nobody, you know, kind of dealt with everybody else as, as much as, as, as I did and we did. Um, so I always had relationships, you know, with Suge Knight. Uh, he was very, very, you know, supportive in, in, of the source and very instrumental to helping the source, including that 95 Source Awards where he spent $100,000 on the set um, that opens up that show. Wow. Uh, he was the only label to spend that kind of money on, on their set, and it really, you know, gave the show an incredible production value. Um, but... Uh, you know, that was a, I mean, there's different aspects. There's always was an East-West rivalry in hip-hop that goes back to the 80s. There was, you know, basically because New York is where hip-hop was created. And um, as it grew and spread and, you know, uh, other parts of the country began to develop their own sort of styles of hip-hop, uh, New York was pretty kind of proprietary, you know, just like people in New York didn't respect music from other parts of the country for many, many years. And a lot of those artists from other parts of the country took offense to that. And so that was something that generally had gone on, you know, since the late 80s throughout the early 90s. Um, when it goes to a different thing is is really when, you know, you have Tupac uh, and and Bad Boy and Biggie, you know, at odds over his shooting and robbery. Um, then he goes away to jail. Um, a lot of people talk about that 95 Source Awards because that was a night where uh, Suge Knight went on the stage and kind of, you know, dissed Puffy a little bit there, yeah. Diddy. And there was some, you know, some tension in the building that night. Nothing happened. There was no fights or anything like that. Um you know, it just got tense for a little while, but everything calmed down. What were you thinking when that was going on? By, by the way, where are you seated when this is happening? And did you have any idea it was going to happen? Uh, no idea, because, again, what people don't recognize a lot of times is going into that night, there was no known problem between Death Row and Bad Boy. You know, again, like I knew all the people at all the camps and knew what was going on and I picked the seating charts and <laughs> figured out where to, you know, sit people and things like that. Um, but Tupac was in jail and nobody knew that Suge Knight had been going to visit him mm. and working out a deal to get him out of jail and signed to death row. That doesn't happen until maybe six weeks after the show. So that night, you know, people knew about Tupac's problems with Bad Boy, but they didn't know that there was no known death row problem with Bad Boy. So there was that little jab and back and forth that happened that night. Uh, but th that really wasn't the spark. When things got really violent was about a month later. And that's when uh, one of Suge Knight's employees, um, a promotions executive for Death Row, gets shot and killed outside of uh, a nightclub in Atlanta where Jermaine Dupri was having a party and Puffy and his guys were there and allegedly one of... Puffy's guys shot and killed uh, Suge's friend uh, out front of that club. That's when things turned really violent uh, and really kind of tense. And, you know, we were, that was a, a, you know, a year, two year period, which, you know, a year goes by and then Tupac gets killed in, uh, you know, Las Vegas and then another six months go by and Biggie gets killed. So it was definitely a, a, a different and strange time, you know, trying to manage around that. We couldn't do the Source Awards in 96. There was just no way to mm. do it kind of authentically and really include everybody because it was just too much unknown at that point. But, um, you know, I did bring it back in 99 with a big network TV deal at UPN where we set all kinds of rating records in 99, 2000, and 2001. Um, so, so you're... So so you're in the middle of what was probably the most famous period in the history of hip hop for for many people and and the most contentious and and you're in the media business and and what does media love Mo media loves a fight media loves to see people going at each other it's gold hmm. right how do you operate in that environment and not exploit the tensions or, or when you look back is that what you did or how do you right. feel like you handled that? Well, that that's a great question and especially in light of you know the world we're living in today right. you know exactly. what you is really what you're describing I don't think it was you know 
quite that way back then in terms of the sensationalized, you know, headlines and stories being, you know, the driving force of our larger media business as a whole, in a sense. I think we sort of, you know, have been evolving into that these last few years. Um, but I always, uh, you know, w- took the took the uh, route that, um, you know, our integrity, our editorial integrity was what, you know, made the source so well-respected um, and valued. Um, and also, you know, that, that w- you know, you could choose to be a National Enquirer st- type of magazine or you could choose to understand that this is hip-hop. It's, you know, it's a little bit different. You have to be kind of aware of certain things and, you know, deal with certain things in a more sensitive way sometimes uh, as a media, you know, uh, owner. Um, because, you know, there's a... You know, a lot of people that accused Vibe magazine in those years of kind of promoting yeah. the beef. And, you know, there were things that they did that they printed and published that, you know, were kind of sensational. And, you know, I took the opposite route. The One of the covers of The Source I did in the middle of 1996, uh, I put Suge Knight on a cover, did an ex- exclusive interview with him, and printed a quote from his interview that said, something like this ain't no east coast west coast thing mm-hmm. you know right on the cover to let people know like hey mm. this isn't the east coast because people were we'll feeding into this east bit. west and it was a it was more of a personal thing between you know death row and bad boy and their friends and people that was going on and then it sort of got morphed into this broader idea through the media and and otherwise um so you know interesting very interesting, important period, uh, and you know, marks, in my opinion, also the the change in hip hop. You know that that we still see to this day. You know, emerges out of you know Tupac's death and the things that happened then. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Do you feel like there was a? Uh, do you feel like the industry changed from those events in that period and said, you know, we we all have too much to lose here. Let's this doesn't need to go there. Did it change? Um, I, I think to an extent, I mean, we, you know, we, the balance was always trying to keep the corporate side and the sort of authenticity of the culture and the street side, um, which is a difficult thing, you know, to do, but, you know, this was also, you know, something that had always been central to me being in the business of hip hop and being a white man, a white Jewish man in, uh, the industry of hip hop. Um, hip hop is a music and a culture that was formed out of the conditions of the inner cities of America that, you know, historically and even, you know, to this day are comprised primarily of, you know, black and brown people uh, in poverty that are dealing with, you know, incredible, uh, you know, kind of situations that are just, you know, they're nothing like what m- most of the rest of us deal with on a day-to-day basis in the world. And, you know, hip-hop I always saw as a, a voice of, of the, you know, the kind of struggle and the pain and the other things, you know, as well as, you know, the joy and the happiness and, the, you know, the other things that, that came from those communities. But that I always felt as, you know, an obligation to, you know, try to make sure that what we were doing was something that would, you know, uh, work to empower those communities and bring change to those communities. And I would argue in the early to mid-90s, that was the direction hip-hop was heading as more of a social and political, you know, cultural movement. Um, And there was a lot of things that were going on that were, you know, pushing us in that direction. But that's, you know, after Tupac's uh, murder, um, and then Biggie subsequently is when you start to see, you know, kind of a, a diminishing of, of, of those, uh, parts of, of, of hip hop. And, um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I just think, uh, you know, that, that's something that, that, you know, that we, we've, we've lost a bit of and that the corporations have sort of gotten a little bit more of a hold over, the commercial side of the music and, um, you know, without a a, a media platform like The Source, what we represented back then, I don't think there's anything like that. That's really why I see such a big opportunity for Breakbeat 
um, you know, because I think we can kind of recreate in some sense. But now across three generations of people, you know, a much bigger audience, um, that kind of, you know, kind of community and and uh, shared, you know, sort of network of information and views and perspectives, um, you know, that will resonate, I think, widely. You know, I, I just think that's, you know, natural when you're dealing with kind of the authenticity that hip hop, uh, you know, brings to the table. So you, as a white guy, I can't imagine what that is like being in the the center of uh, this movement that's you know become an, uh, such a vibrant industry. How has that evolved for you? How wh- what is your experience like as a white guy at the center of it, and how has that changed over the years? Um, it, it really hasn't. I wouldn't say it's changed very much. I mean, um, I'm someone that um, you know at a at a young age. Uh, Grew up around a lot of, you know, black people in D.C., um, got comfortable with them, and they always, you know, welcomed me. I never felt, you know, uh, you know, like an outcast, uh, you, know, I, you know, amongst my friends and peers growing up in, you know, junior high, high school, and so on. Um, you know, so, um, I, you know, I, there were times early on in particular with The Source where, there was some, you know, kind of buzz in media, you know, stuff. Oh, you know, there's two white guys from Harvard are starting a rap magazine. And, yeah. you know, is that, you know, fair or right or this? And, you know, I always felt that, uh, you know, the proof was sort of in, in the content and the pudding. And, yeah. and, and, and people couldn't deny the credibility and the authenticity of the content that we put in the source. Because of kind of what I was saying earlier, the way I approached it as a publisher you know, uh, understanding, you know, a, a certain way that things should be done to really, you know, you know, create the most authentic uh, platform. So, um, it, you know, people have always accepted me in the hip-hop community, um, no matter who they are, you know, black, white, you know, Asian, you know, Latino, whatever. I've built relationships across, across the board. And... Um, so any criticism yeah. of your involvement is not, it hasn't had any results that were impactful to you, and it really wasn't from people that knew you very well, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. With, um, I mean, you know, G- uh, George Floyd is not the first instance we have a pr- police brutality in this country, but um, uh, but it, it, it's no less a topic uh, than I think it was a long time ago. Is is breakbeat an opportunity for progress um, socially, and is and is racial reconciliation a potential outcome of what you're working on? Uh, another, you know, good question, and and the answer I think is yes. I mean, that is my goal with breakbeat is to create a platform that can uh, have a, a very, you know serious and meaningful impact in creating social and political change um and I, i'm not sure the term you used about racial reconciliation. reconciliation i mean you know i think there has to be some racial kind of equity involved you know i mean that's a that's you know that's to me what it comes down to you know reparations equity you know doing something you know concrete to address the realities that the statistics you know just you know there's no question about the statistics, uh, what racism and systemic racism, racism have done, continues to do. Uh, you know, hopefully there's, there's more, you know, behind that now because of, you know, George Floyd. And, and um, you know, obviously there's been a lot of companies that are, you know, spending money trying to do things. Um, so, uh, yeah, I hope that we can be a channel uh, to help you know, direct some of those uh, uh, resources um, and also a platform to kind of, you know, be a voice for, for the community in, in a way that is, you know, again, very authentic. Is there an organization or an infrastructure that you're aligned with that is working to facilitate some of the change you're describing? Um, you know, I, I did start an organization last year called the Hip Hop Political Education Summit, and we did a few events last year. Um, we kind of, you know, pulled back uh, on that. My my partner and I both got, got kind of busy with other things. 
Um, so we're looking at, you know, what we're going to do with that organization. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people out there in the activist community um, and in the media community that I think as I'm getting back out here with Breakbeat and people see what I'm doing and hear about what I'm doing, I'll be able to create the kind of, you know, networks um, and, you know, uh, with with some of the resources that are already out there and help connect the dots. That's something also I was always really good at doing and building the source was, you know, connecting the dots and networking and, and uh, you know, I think that's something that, that uh, there's a big opportunity to do right now. So let's uh, we're, we're, we're winding down time wise, but let's talk a little bit about uh, for the advertisers. This is going to be an ad supported platform, correct? It is. You yeah. know, our, our partners uh, and strategic partners are, are DAX, mm -hmm. uh, who, you, you know, you know, uh, you know, they're helping us uh, monetize and sell the ads. Um, you know, I think, you know, this is an opportunity for brands to uh, get in on the ground floor of something that uh, is going to get bigger, is going to really uh, resonate with very important audiences, uh, diverse but uh, very, you know, influential audiences. Um, you know, the, the, the talent and the content that we're producing is premium. Um, and, uh, I don't see anything in the market, you know, that really is, is doing what we're doing. And, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, at the source, I was also, you know, spe I also spearheaded, you know, the advertising sales effort into mm. corporate America, um, you know, was the first person to really go out and talk about hip hop to the executives at Nike in the early 1990s and Mountain Dew and different places like that, um, and also created a lot of innovative marketing concepts. The source uh, vans were these, you know, uh, mobile vehicles with sound systems and, you know, television screens that traveled the country um, and different things like that that I, I, I'm excited, you know, to get back into. So we can do some creative promotions together. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. I think hip-hop is still misunderstood by the advertising community. Um, I mean, everyone in the community, it's different than it was 30 years ago when people had no idea what hip hop was that I was talking to. Now everyone knows what it is, or at least think they know what it is. But I think, again, there's still just so much association with the music um, side of it. And, you know, people aren't seeing the kind of, you know, more intricate levels of, you know, ways that it, it forms a community of people that, that want to consume content um you know that that uh, appeals to them and has a style and a tone directed to them across you know all forms sports news politics etc again so as you look uh forward um w w you're i'm sure you're also looking back at the the source and and what lessons do you take from that chapter that you're carrying into this one um, I mean, many. I, I've made a lot of mistakes, and I, you know, I, I'm hopeful that I won't make any of the same mistakes again. Um, my business partner, I didn't get a chance to talk about yet, is Kendrick Ashton. Um, Kendrick is a, you know, just an amazing guy. You've met him. Yeah, smart guy. Um, Kendrick, uh, you know, was a very, very successful investment banker. Uh, you know, founding, you know, partner in, in a very big firm in New York. Uh, he's opened several you know, amazing businesses uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. He's on, you know, he's just very well respected uh, on a lot of boards and very knowledgeable. Um, you know, if I had had a partner like Kendrick back in the days with The Source, I think I would have made different decisions financially and investment-wise and deal-wise when I got to certain level of the business things that I think, you know, I didn't do well. Um, and... Uh, you know, there's a number of things. He's he's the first thing I think of because he's a great balance to me. Um, he's not only numbers, he's also very creative and, you know, has come up with lots of the best ideas that we've had for the network creatively so far as well. So, um, you know, that's one, one thing, um, you know, I think that I've learned is, you know, to find the right partners. Doesn't hurt, does it? Yeah. And hopefully you're building the database again on this one. Yeah, exactly. That's important. <laughs> And so if there's if there's one thing that you want to see in real life that happens as a byproduct of the work that you're doing with Breakbeat, what is it? Did I say Breakbeat? Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, man, one thing. Um, oh, uh, 
I mean, again, I just think it's it's creating, you know, businesses, institutions, partnerships, and things that can lead to um, the type of you know very substantial and meaningful change that we need to make to achieve this kind of um, you know racial equity and kind of eliminate you know the the poverty divide and the you know the racial you know components of that um, and I know that's you know it's a lofty kind of goal but you know we talked about it before and it is something that I want to be a part of I don't know that breakbeat will be the you know the be all end all of it but I think it can hopefully play but a part that's the journey that you're on well, and that's what we're trying to do with Media Roundtable in a, in a different sense. But, you know, we're not going to solve this problem of polarization and media's exploitation of our differences. But we're going to talk about it, and we're going to bring attention to it, and we're going to try. We're going to try to encourage some advertisers to care as well. And uh, what else can we do? Right? Yeah, there you go. So uh, if people want to engage with some of your, uh, your new content that you've got out, where should they go? Uh, well, our website is breakbeatmedia.com. And you can find, you know, just kind of links to our shows that we've got out and previews of some of our other shows there, uh, links to our social media, you know, Instagram at Breakbeat Media, Twitter at Breakbeat Media. And then our, our uh, shows are either on uh, our YouTube channel, Breakbeat Media YouTube. Uh, right now we just have the Don't Call Me White Girl show out. Uh, she's a phenomenal talent, going to be a superstar, a young uh, woman from Philadelphia uh, who's just you know, just super smart and super funny. Uh, people love her. Her audience is growing, you know, daily. Um, and, uh, you know, you can find that on all the podcast apps as well. And Culturati that I talked about is on, you know, Spotify and uh, Apple and all the podcast apps. So we're doing audio and then video for, you know, s most of the shows. Not all of them have video. Well, thank you for the work you're doing. Thanks for being here with me. This is exciting. Yeah, man, really yeah. awesome that uh, I'm, you know, got a chance to to meet you and be here, and that you fit me in on short notice. I appreciate well, it. Well, it's my pleasure. Anytime you're in town, this show is dedicated to advancing our mission of mobilizing marketers to promote truth and civility in journalism. We value clarity, truth, fairness, respect, de-escalation, and tolerance, and we invite you to engage with us at MediaRoundtable.com. If you found the show helpful and you're committed to our cause, please follow us on iTunes, Spotify, or YouTube. Don't be afraid to make nice comments as well uh, or wherever you like to listen. It's always free. And if you're a marketer and you want a good agency to help you live this stuff out, Oxford Road is our agency. And you can reach us by visiting OxfordRoad.com and subscribe to our weekly newsletter, build our database. It's called The Influencer. And I want to say a th special thank you to Bianca, Kyle, Jennifer, and the team at Podcast One. And as always, influence responsibly. <laughs>